Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Games in Education. Oh, uh, I'm going to actually start over again. I always do it also with my, uh, since it's going to be a podcast in the end, I turn my camera off. Okay. Um, just great. to say bandwidth. Uh, all right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Games and Education podcast. Today, we have with us Melissa Pilikowski. Did I get that right? Pretty close. Yeah, Pilikowski. Pilikowski. She is a educator from, care to introduce yourself, where are you a teacher and uh, what do you teach? Um, I teach in Nebraska, a small town, rural town, about 3,000 people. Um, and I teach 11th, 12th grade English. And not only is she an amazing English teacher uh, for high school, she also hosts a Twitter chat called the Games for Education Twitter chat. She is a very large gamer and education uh, enthusiast and practitioner. And she just also created a presentation uh, for what? Where did you actually present this for the first time? Anywhere in specific? Uh, yeah, I just presented it for the first time at Summer Spark, which is hosted by the University School of Milwaukee in, of course, Milwaukee. So great conference, by the way. Total props to them for anybody who wants to go. Definitely worth it. And also what's worth it is if you ever want to join, I join as frequently as I can when I'm putting my girls to bed. The uh, games, hashtag games for Ed Twitter chat. It is on Thursdays at 7 p.m. Central? 7 p.m. Central. I got it right. Uh, and it is a great, great time to chat with other teachers about games and education. But right now, I really want to talk about, you wrote this great podcast about top 10 games for education inside the classroom and i thought we could share and talk about these with everybody in the audience so any teacher can find out these games to use because i guess you can start because it is your whole presentation why are these 10 games special for the classroom well the reason i picked out these 10 games and i have i think i have 29 or 30 actually on the slide deck um but i picked out the first 10 because they're usable in any classroom that I can think of, regardless of the content area and um, whatever level you're at, I think, you know, probably grades three through 12, maybe even lower than that for some of them, you can take one of these games and implement it into your classroom in your next unit somehow. Yeah, that's what the big thing about these that I love so much for the audience is they are quick to use, easy to grab. If you're even stuck on something to do, you can pull out probably one of these to use. So if you're trying to plan a lesson, it doesn't take too long to think of a way that they, you can use these in your classroom. Exactly. All right. So the first one I want to talk about, because I love it more than any, is you put Jenga writing. Care to, I, I just love using Jenga in the classroom in multiple ways, but what do you do? Please explain Jenga writing to my uh, listeners here. So what I did with Jenga writing, I actually started it with a poetry unit and I wanted to find ways where kids did more of making poetry because otherwise writing poetry can be really daunting, especially looking at that blank, blank page. So I just took a Jenga set and using labels, I wrote words on each of the blocks, mainly nouns and verbs, threw a few adjectives in there. And then after that, the concept was pretty simple. The kids set up the Jenga tower, they played Jenga, but as they pulled out each block, they would write down the word before they put the block back on top. Eventually the tower falls, and then the kids had the choice of they could each write their own poem using those words, or I also gave them the option that they could write a collaborative poem using their words. So, with that format, they already have a list of words and then they have a starting spot and they can look at what kind of connotations those words have and where their poem could go from there. But this could work with all types of writing. I mean, if you wanted to take it to a different content area, you can use labels, put in the vocabulary words or put in some of the concepts from a certain chapter or from a certain unit and then have students use those concepts or terminology to write a narrative or to write a summary about what they learned in that section. 
Absolutely. I, I'm thinking of like a science class, like a biology or a chemistry class, even. I mean, oh, you have the mm -hmm. terms and now write a whole biology explaining what you words you had to get to, so you can understand them. That's so great. Definitely. I mean, really, this is something you could do. Math, music, yeah. so many different areas. And, and I will say for a lot of people, Jenga is a great thing for a lot of games in education. Uh, I, I know one I love. There's a game called Dread that also uses a Jenga tower. And Dread is a game where it is a role playing game where you have to, you know, move around, do actions. But in order to succeed or fail at an action, you have to pull a Jenga tile. And when the whole Jenga set mm -hmm. falls down, your character dies or gets injured. And, Ooh, I like that. and what's really good about that is if you're trying to teach suspense in literature and that idea of suspense, nothing is more suspenseful than a Jenga tower. And it teaches you that anything can be suspenseful as long as there's a motivator to it. So yeah, so mm -hmm. Jenga can be used for that. Jenga can be used for this idea of just putting words on the blocks. And I, I do Jenga can be used for so many things, even in the way younger grades is just Jenga. <laughs> yeah, and, and the idea with Jenga, and we talked about this the other evening on the chat, is going beyond just using it the traditional way, but then some teachers talked about, well, how else could you use these blocks? What could you build using these blocks? Or what would happen if you had different colored blocks? Or, you know, how can you use it for different team building activities? So just thinking outside the box and deconstructing the game opens up another realm of possibilities too. They also, I've seen Jenga be used as a, you can put actions on them. Um, oh, yeah. So it's kind of like a way to do lesson design where it's like, what type of thing are we going to explore today? We pull the tiles and it's kind of like hidden that way of what we're going to do. And it combines to create ideas. It's just, there's so much a Jenga tower can do. I love a Jenga tower. Absolutely. And, and for your tactile kids. Yes, exactly. Perfect. So we got a second one here, Scattergories. Now, I am not. I should be more familiar with Scattergories. I don't play it that much. Care to explain Scattergories to me? Absolutely. So Scattergories is just a reg... I wouldn't call it a board game, but pretty similar. And it comes with a set of lists. Each list, I think, has 10 or 15 prompts on it, such as bodies of water, U.S. cities, U.S. presidents. And... It, the game also comes with an alphabet die, 26 letters on it. So one person rolls the die, say the letter that comes up is M, and then everyone has two minutes to write down something for every prompt on the list that starts with the letter M. So bodies of water might be moat, presidents might be Madison. After those two minutes, everyone comes together, shares their answers, but if you have a repeat answer as someone else in the group, doesn't count, you don't get points for it. So the focus is on being original, being unique. So I try to figure out, you know, how could this game be brought to the classroom because at my husband's Christmas, their families, scattered gories gets really intense. How could I bring this intensity? So one way I did it was I just gave students a sheet of paper that had the alphabet on it. You could have kids write their own alphabet. And then in the unit, when we got done reading Beowulf, I gave them a class period to write down as all of the words A through Z that related to Beowulf. And they were welcome to use their dictionaries, use the sources, use the text itself but they had to be completely original. And so kids really, really thought in depth about the text and tried to find words that no one else would use. And then that next day when we brought all the kids together and they compared answers, it brought out their argumentative skills. Because for some kids, I think one used X and they wrote down Xanax. And I don't even remember their justification why, but they had to provide a justification to the rest of the class of why Xanax fit with Beowulf. And I don't remember if the rest of the class voted it down or accepted it, but it just promotes those deeper connections and those argumentative skills. They're just a really simple concept. I love that communication collaboration right there of having to, you know, battle it out. That's part of gamification in its own way, a little competition. Mm -hmm. Also, it seems like this just idea of thinking about 
the, you know, finding the unique examples, I could see this being used in almost any classroom. And especially, you know, I know a lot of classrooms now have Chromebooks, giving them Chromebooks after research different uh -huh. categories and ideas to use for it is a really great idea. I love the unique examples. This is such an easy game. Anybody can do it. And I, I guess you just need a category die of the letters, right? That's all you need. Or, um, I mean, if you did the alphabet version that you could just have them write down the alphabet and have it just as one topic. The internet, I know that there's at least one website on the internet that has an alphabet die too that you can just roll digitally. It's not as cool as the real thing, but hey, it'll work in a pinch. Yeah, so great idea. Once again, we, vocabulary is so important and all the, you know, if you're having trouble with vocabulary, get one of these out there, a die in a game and boom, you have a way to do vocabulary that's engaging to students. Mm -hmm. Now your next one on here, I do love a lot and I'm still in beta as well, been playing it called Storium EDU. And I'm going to yeah. say that is a that is dear to my heart because it is actually a role playing game system in a way, but also group storytelling mm -hmm. uh, online. And for any teacher, uh, you should try to get Story of Edu. Now, you want to explain it from your side. You've used it probably with your class more than I have, and uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts on it. And then I'll say some too because I also love it. So, care to sure. explain how Story of Edu works? It is basically. Honestly, to me, it's a role-playing game system online, but it's even more than that. It's a story creative fiction game. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a collaborative fiction game. So you can have as many or as many students on a writing team as you want. So as the teacher, you go in and you begin, you set up your class, and then you can choose kids out of the class to be on a team to write a story. And each student has the opportunity to choose their character. So they give different options on Storium of kind of different character archetypes. I had a few students who just really loved uploading their own avatars to personalize their characters just a little bit more. And then Storium EDU comes with one default deck of cards. And this deck of cards provides kind of different prompts for the story. So there are, you know, probably eight different setting cards of different settings that the story might be at. And there might be eight different types of motivation cards or eight different um, resolution cards, just directions for the kids to go. As my kids found out, they're not completely mandatory. A lot of my kids decided they wanted to go and kind of branch out where the story led them. And I absolutely let them do that. But the cards provide just a little bit of direction for the students. And also, if they follow the cards fairly well, they start understanding a character arc as well. So the kids all collaborate. There are three acts to each story. Every student contributes their part to each act. And then there's a closing to the story where they each have their last little component that they can write in to wrap up the story at the end. And I'll also say with it, not only does it do that, uh, if you wanted to, as a teacher, create your own deck, you are welcome to create your own cards oh, yeah. for story ideas as well. And um, I think that's where there's huge power where it goes beyond just English language arts is yes. if you're a history teacher and you're teaching the Revolutionary War, then you can create a deck that's just based on the events of the Revolutionary War. And even more powerful, I had a few kids who I just gave them my password because they're seniors, and they created their own decks. And they thought that that was really fun, that they could go beyond just the one provided deck by Storium, and they could create their own decks. And you could definitely have students do that. They could be creating decks, say, as an American history capstone. Kids could create decks for one event in American history. And then the next week, other students use those decks to write a story. So there's just lots of possibilities with this story of EDU game. And it ties into everything I've talked about on this podcast with other people about the role-playing games in the classroom. It's mm -hmm. essentially a storytelling role-playing game in a kind of what used to be called a play-by-post. So each person gets to talk at their own time, and then they get to read it when they have a chance. And right. 
Uh, if you'll recall, this interview will be coming out after another one by uh, McGay Baker. McGay Baker, what she talked about, everything about how easy it is to take a nursery rhyme and suddenly have a story out of it. This story, Me to You, is that world you can make it with. And it's that collaborative storytelling we were looking for. But it's also online, so it's easier to keep track of. Instead of like a role-playing game where it is played in person, where you have to be there, it can be done asynchronously, which is great. Yeah. Uh, and, and also, everything is written down, so they have to use their writing abilities for it. So it is a great option for anybody, and I highly recommend Story Me to You. It is in beta, so they're still working on it, but at the moment, the beta is free, so anybody can mm -hmm. sign up for it and do it. And I really recommend trying it with your classes. If you ever want to get into the role-playing games I work on, uh, or if you want to do any of these things, it's just great and easy. And yeah, use it in science and they have to tell science stories. Maybe it's a sci-fi yeah. science fiction story. Use it mm -hmm. in math and they have to tell a adventure using mathematics uh, and different problems and equations they have to solve. And history especially, you could make a history deck super easily of types of characters inside a world and it's very easy to use too i'd say as a teacher i have been trying to use it but since i'm a tosa i haven't gotten a full classroom to use it with yet as a teacher what are your thoughts of the system oh i thought the system was so easy to learn so easy to use uh kids catch on to it right away very simple i think it would also be a great way if you're looking for a way to maybe connect your classroom to someone else's classroom you're looking for what kind of project you can do this would be a really easy one to synchronize between two classrooms over distance whether you wanted to connect with someone else in another state someone in another country can they share a, a story system to teachers I believe so. That would be something I would, I guess I'd need to check in a little bit more, but I think even if they had one teacher respond, I think you could. I don't know. That's a good question, but I think you could. And then the next one is one, I love this idea. When I saw it, I just went, oh my gosh, we got to try more of this. And uh, that is a mystery box because that is such a thing right now and so easy to use a mystery box, but I have never done this and you probably know it better. Please share a mystery box because this is truly an any subject awesome way to get a lesson going. Okay, so last summer I discovered this website called the Mystery, what is it? The Mystery pa Mysterious Package Company. And this company will, for the right amount of money, send you a box of artifacts or texts and put together, they all tell some type of story. And your goal, of course, is to figure out what is the story? What is going on here? It's just like a modern day detective or archeologist. And I loved this idea because it just worked so well with students' critical thinking skills and close reading and drawing inferences and conclusions. So I decided to try it out by making mystery boxes for Macbeth when we first started reading Macbeth. So I just bought some paper mache boxes and I put in some artifacts from Macbeth. So I put in uh, just a cheap crown that I got off Amazon, a picture of a bloody dagger, Macbeth's letter to his wife telling her about the witches, an invitation to Macduff to Macbeth's coronation, which is crumpled up. So that in itself is an important clue in the box. And just some other things from the play. And then I put the students into groups and gave each group a box and just said, what's going on? Make some predictions about this play, about this story. And then afterwards we came together and compared those conclusions and those predictions. But it was amazing just the collaboration and the teamwork that the kids had together and especially the amount of close reading that they were doing of really trying to figure out how the pieces work together. They probably read that more closely than anything else in the play I could have given them if I just, if when they read the play directly because they were 
just trying to figure out what is the mystery here. And by having so many different pieces too, kids can share and pass pieces around. So there's just enough variety and mystery for everyone to get involved. And, you know, I, it's so funny. This literally engages everything a student can have. This is probably one of the best things I've ever seen. And so easy. I mean, you made five artifacts, six. Oh, and, yeah. I don't even know how many. <laughs> right. Well, let's look at this because I, I just have to share. If you've read and listened to my other episodes, I did a whole one on Drive and agency. Look at the student agency mm -hmm. involved in this game. They are making their own inferences. They're making their own ideas, their choice. Nobody is telling them how to interpret Macbeth. They're getting to do it. Right. There is so much of the um, uh, mastery involved in it because they have to keep learning how to do it. They might get things wrong. That's okay. They'll keep gaining it. And if you talk about purpose, this so engages their purpose motivation function so well because they feel they're in it. They want to solve the mystery. They want to be on it. Nobody's telling them how they have to do it. So powerful a tool right there to use in education. And... And then if you talk about, you know, this also encompasses for all those educators, like the four C's of education right there. It's got collaboration, communication all through this because they have to talk about it all the time. And gosh, the creativity and critical thinking, they're making up their own versions of Macbeth. Who knows if they're right or wrong? I love it. And look how hard they have to think about trying to interpret these things. This is the all in one tool to get students engaged in the learning and really make them think about it more. Yeah, and what someone else brought up uh, Thursday night at our chat, which kind of blew my mind too, was then someone said, well, I think I'm just going to have my students do this. I'm just going to have my students make their own mystery boxes. And I just went, wow, I have about, you know, 30 small boxes up in my cupboard I've been keeping for years thinking there'll be some purpose for them. I just know it. Like, there's my purpose. So yes, I'll still continue doing this Macbeth one, but then I'll have some other options for students to create their own mystery boxes, maybe about the books that, that they're reading or, you know, something else. There's just a whole nother world of possibility spinning it with students now creating their own. You literally blew my mind as much as yours was blown. That is, yeah, no, that, I don't know why I just say that right now. Yes, let students make their own mystery boxes after they've done one. See what clues they would give to a book, a history unit. You could do this in science and math super easily too. I mean, you could do a bunch of objects together. What do they have in common in a math class? A uh, bunch of different formulas. What do they have? What's their thing that links them together in this mystery? Or a science class for sure. You put a bunch of different objects. What is their chemical compounds? You know, you don't even tell them, let them try to figure out why these items are in a box. That's really where it is. You give them nothing. Let them try to figure it out. Students love this uh, so much. And it, yeah, it, it, it's a connect your path game right there. It's like when I've done before, I do these connect paths. I would take two pictures that have nothing to do with each other and then say, find the ways they have to connect and they have to go through Google and search everything. Oh, Let yeah. search. It is just love it. so engaging. They love mysteries. And that mystery package is so simple. Wow. I, I, I know I should be going on to something. I just can't wrap my head around anything else I want to talk about after that. It's like, it's, yeah, it's just that that's one of my just new favorite creations is the mystery box because it's free. It's cheap. Yeah. It's cheap too. Limitless. Oh yeah. Uh, and you know, by the way, if you while objects are great, if you can't even afford some little objects, if you just print out some different pictures of things and some letters, yeah. you get the same effect. Yeah. And I mean, seriously, look around the house. You know, how oh, much yeah. stuff around the house do you really not use? Throw it in a box. Becomes your game. I swear, maybe we should do a mysterious package education company. I also, I almost want to just make that for teachers now. <laughs> like, as oh, a, how as like amazing would that be? Wow. It would. Oh, I okay. am so intrigued now. I know, me too. Okay, well, I, I, I need to go on. Okay, all right, yeah. Uh, so the next one is another great one uh, for all your sports loving students because there are always so many sports loving students. And, you know, with that, engaging them in something like a March Madness bracket system is also a super easy way for many things to be used and increase that competition that you want. So you care to explain your March Madness and how that is a, how creating a competition system can engage students in learning as well? 
Oh, definitely. So, you know, you take the March Madness idea and I connected it to the um, most unsports thing ever, which is poetry. And just at the beginning of the unit, trying to get some of these kids interested in poetry, because I got some who naturally are, um, but I also have kids who aren't, but they love sports. So we did a competition just called the best poem ever. And students were given a few days to go out and find the best poem. And it could be a song too, didn't matter what it was. And they would nominate this poem slash song. They would write a nomination letter, which was essentially an argument. We looked at some sample letters. And then what I did was I printed everything off and put them into very official looking folders. And I gave everyone a secret number. I have all of my students have a secret number for anonymous activities during class. And then the other sections would judge a previous section's argument. So I would split them up into each section up into groups. They would take two poems, read them side by side, read their letters, kind of do a head by head comparison, and then they would move one of those poems onto the tournament. And then we would go through the day, go through that round, and then the next day, we would do the same thing again with the poems that had moved forward. So one, I got kids reading a lot of poems just to find their favorite poem. Two, they then read more poems that maybe some of them they didn't like, but they had to read letters to go along with those poems to further understand them better. And then three, they're using argumentation skills, both written and verbal and just working together in groups to debate about poetic devices. So it's just such this, such an easy thing to adapt to almost any classroom. I know some teachers have used this March Madness idea with historical figures. I've seen it done with chemical elements off the periodic table where you just create an argument for why yours is the best one, the strongest one, whatever the reasoning or the purpose of it is. Again, just a simple concept that you can do in almost any classroom. Um, the other night, uh, one, someone mentioned he's a theater teacher and he's like, gosh, I wish I would have known this a week earlier. We could have done this for the Tonys. And I was like, oh man, that would have been so great because your kids would have had discussions the day before the Tonys of who they're picking. And then the next day after the Tonys, all the kids are flipping out because the wrong person won and this is why. So, so easy to adapt anywhere. And, and you know what, you, 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 you kept on something so well. I think you're repeating it, so I don't know why I'm repeating myself again. Hopefully that's just my own thing. Uh, can you mute yours for a sec? Mm-hmm. Okay, cool, hopefully now I don't hear myself. All right, don't know why I was doing it that time. Uh, but with this uh, is such a great game because it involves oh, debate. debate. And the more debate we have with students, I always think is a great idea. The more students can compete with each other, talk to each other, and find ways to argue with each other in a way, or at least create arguments. It is It engages students so much. They just love to do it, debate, agree, disagree. And this, I would say, sounds like such a great method to get anybody to want to start having that conversation because super easily they want to. And, uh, you know, the more conversations they have, that is more communication and collaboration going on in the classroom. Just love it. You can, you can speak again now. I don't know. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't, didn't want to interrupt. No, no. I just don't know. I, for a little bit, my voice was repeating itself. Okay. I'll, I'll edit this out. Don't worry. Uh, but yes, thank you for March Madness. That is awesome. And then now what is this one? I, I, I saw this. I'm trying to understand it from the slide deck, but I'd love to hear it. The Google vocab challenge. Okay. Yeah, that was a, just a game that I created because I was really, really jealous of social studies teachers. They have their 
geography draft games where students or or current event teachers where students get to draft their favorite country or I shouldn't say just favorite but draft the countries that have the most are going to have the most hits on Google so what reading about this I found out was that students were doing a lot of reading in the news and researching countries because one, they wanted to find out which countries were there lots of current news going on today, but also what did they predict in the next week or two or month? Would there be countries with a lot of upheaval or a lot of changes that would be newsworthy? And then every week or every month, these students got points based on how many times their country was mentioned in the news or made Google hits. And I just thought that's really cool. What an inventive way to get kids really reading the news and thinking critically about the relationships between countries. So I wanted to do some kind of a drafting game and I wanted to figure out just an easy way to do it. So I thought about first vocabulary because we use quite a few words and those would be easy to draft. Plus, I liked the idea of to better learn vocabulary is by making connections between words, not just rote memorization of the words, but also how the words relate to other ideas in our world. And so I created this game called uh, Google Vocab Challenge. And first, my student groups each drafted three or four of the vocabulary words that we have each month. And then is when we actually play the game. And I will put up a random word or random phrase, such as, um, let's go refrigerator, because I'm looking at mine right now. And each group looks at the words they've drafted and they try to determine which of their words when paired with refrigerator would get the most Google hits. So they have to think about the connections between the words, which one do they predict will be most likely to appear on Google. And then we simply type in those pairs of words, the team that gets the most hits and gets a point. When I first explained this to my students, I mean, they were really hesitant. <laughs> you know, some games just bomb. And they kind of thought this was going to be one of them. And after they played the first round, they were all like, oh, we're in. It was just a concept that they attached to. It was kind of once you got going, it was so easy. But they really started to make connections between the words, understanding the words just on a deeper level, because every single round, they had to think about the meaning of the word. They had to think about the different contexts that the word could be used in. I had one group of seniors, their, the word that time was, or one of the vocab words was stark. And I was getting ready to select the new random word to pair with Stark. And I had one kid who just went, could we have snow as a word? And I just looked at him for a second. Now they just Game of Thrones on that thing right there. Yeah. And then I went, oh, you are a smart child, young man. And... I didn't because I knew what was going to happen, but I was just like, kudos to you for your cleverness. Um, but, you know, they just start thinking of different ways the word could be used. And it embeds that vocabulary knowledge in their brains so much more than just an average worksheet. It does. And also, yeah, the, the, it's such an easy vocabulary game for them to do. And yeah, it, I love it. That's just super simple and easy. That's really cool. I got, I'm going to try that one now. I like it a lot. Good, yeah. Uh, so, um, I, I see a Pear Deck here, and I definitely want to talk a little about Pear Deck's flash, flashcard factory, but I want to go really over to another one too, because I'm very interested in them. Uh, and they really work well with my game stuff that I talk about. Uh, code names. I love code names. It is probably one of my favorite games to play. Uh, definitely has vocabulary into it. Mm -hmm. But 
I'm curious how you implement code name in a classroom to give an, to, to, to tell the class, uh, to, like class, the edu the people <laughs> listening out there, you are my class, apparently audience out there. Um, <laughs> Codenames is a little bit of board card game. I can't just describe what type of game it is, but there are tiles and your tiles uh, are words. And you, one player is the red team leader and the other is the blue team leader. And they have to, using only one word and a number of how many words, they have to guess, they have to get people to guess which words they're thinking of to get their tiles. And wow, that does not describe it well enough. But it, it's it, hard it, to it, describe. It's hard to describe code names. Nonetheless, code names is pretty much a game of can you get other people to try to guess what you are thinking of by using one word? Right. That sounds important. And I'm guessing the same way you probably use this as a vocabulary ish game or. How do you use code names in the classroom? Um, yeah, it could definitely be a game that you use with vocabulary words, which I've done. I think it works really well with concepts too. I'll go back to our Macbeth idea that I can make 20 different tiles with maybe Macbeth characters and Macbeth, Macbeth motifs such as, you know, blood, dagger, um, dreams you know, major ideas, major concepts from the play. So then that way, you know, students have to really know the characters and really know the concepts in depth. Say for example, the card is blood that you're trying to get your team to guess. So if I'm well, correct, how many things so connect with blood and Macbeth? Just so I understand, no. you choose the cards for your code names when you do this. You hand pick right. the ones. Got it. That's such a great idea with the costume. Okay, sorry, I love it. All right. Oh on. yeah, you, I I hand pick them. You could also because I love code names. Pictures the game. I mean, so you could also have pictures, which you know, when you think about science and the graphics and science and different you know images, parts of the cell, um, you know, um, chemistry graphics. There's a lot of potential there too. And of course, spinning it back on students creating it. Mm -hmm. I know Tisha Richmond um, out of South Medford in Oregon, she had her students one day in her culinary class. They made a code names game using, you know, I don't know, whatever culinary skills they were using, which I'm sure that they were all far better than my culinary skills. But the students created the game and then got to play the game. So in-depth learning on just two different levels. And and you also brought up codename pictures. I will say this. This can also be used with younger grades, too. Uh, I have a kindergartner myself, and she plays codenames pictures. Uh, so yeah, if you even want to do this with kindergarten, first, or second grade, if they can't do the vocabulary words, you could have pictures, and then they have to critical think how they could create the pictures or tie that into their concept they're talking about. Same type of thing, and it can be used with any grade very easily. Uh, Absolutely. And, and because of this, if you didn't, why well, you should buy code names because it's just a fun <laughs> game for ten dollars. Uh, if you don't even want to buy it, you could pretty much make your own set of little picture tiles or little vocab tiles you want to use uh, and, and play around with it. I do mm -hmm. still highly recommend buying it just because you should support a great game. Um, but yeah, anybody, I mean, you want to just try it. Easy to try. Yeah, I've seen there's an image somewhere out in the internet of a teacher who just used whiteboard, who just wrote all the words in a grid on the whiteboard and then the class just played it off the whiteboard. So it could even just be as basic as that. Mm -hmm. Now, the next one on there I want to talk about because it's Choose Your Own Adventure. And I know Choose Your Own Adventure games are one of the coolest things in the world. Uh, I've seen how you can make a Choose Your Own Adventure for those who maybe teachers remember when they were young. You could read the book and every time you get to a page, it says go here or go there. And then you get to describe what happens. Uh, they are just great for any classroom. Before we go into this really cool thing you have called Twine and even how to do it with Google Slides. Uh, Care to share your thoughts of why Choose Your Own Adventure is so great in the classroom? I mean, I think it's great because it's all the critical thinking they could do by having to create their own stories. It teaches how stories work. It's such a great story game. Why do you love Choose Your Own Adventure before we go into the other cool stuff? 
I think one of the powerful parts of the choose your own adventure game is that it really emphasizes the cause and effect idea of how everything that happens in our world and all the decisions that we all make, including students, can have different effects on, I, you know, effects on the world. I've used it with uh, Hamlet, introducing Hamlet. I've created a choose your own adventure game of how different decisions he could have made could have led to a, an alternate ending. I was first introduced to this by Dr. Matt Farber when he used it with his middle school kids to write alternate histories. You know, what would have happened in the Civil War if General Lee would have done X instead of Y? How would that have led to potentially a different outcome. So, you know, there's just that great critical thinking there of the butterfly effect of if this person would have chosen this, what likely would have happened next, what likely would have happened after that. So just the idea of sequencing and you know, making conclusions, making inferences, um, but also just thinking about that whole cause and effect idea and the impact it has on the world. Absolutely. It's probably one of the best writing activities and for story developing activities. And also, as you said, history activities, alternate ideas. It's a very powerful tool for so many different genres. Even a lot of earth science can use it if they are talking about, uh, you know, dinosaurs or they're talking mm -hmm. about uh, a habitat uh, and the cause and effect of the habitat. It's great for they choose your own adventure to do with it. But now you shared a tool there that I haven't heard of, and I'm very interested, called Twine. And it looks like Twine is a choose-your-own-adventure maker. And I think this is really cool. So I've never seen it before. What is Twinery, I guess, or Twinery? How does it work? It's really, it's just a basic, um, very low coding required type system that students can use to make their own choose your adventure stories. So you, you get into there. I would say there's, you do need to do a little bit of tutorial. It's not super flashy. It's not quite as intuitive as say like story M E D U is, but with my 11th and 12th graders, actually, I think they had an easier time getting in there than I did. I just kind of provided a little help here and there of just getting the basics going. And then after that, they were fine. But it provide, Twine provides both a platform for writing, but also it provides the graphic organizer part that as you add each section, it kind of shows where the story is going to. It shows the different branches of it. So it's a really nice visual display that allows kids to see the overall picture of the story. And then you can download the story from Twine and you can use a couple, there's a few different open source places online that you can use to publish the story. It's not really flashy, but it's really simple, it works really well. Especially uh, another site, Inkle Writer, was a lot prettier to oh, use. Yeah. I think you cut out there, can you say it again, Ink, what, what's it called? I love that one, it's Ink. Uh, uh, Inkle Writer. Yeah, Inkle Writer is really nice. Another it is, but now it's gone. Oh, it's gone? Yeah, they, oh. I'm not sure if it's gone yet, but it, it is going, like they have announced that they're done. So now I think Twinery is kind of the option at the well, moment. Well, another one I've used is just Google Slides. And you could oh, make sure. a choose your adventure with Google Slides by Google just- Google Slides, Google Forms, yeah, either Google one. Google Forms too, yeah, Google Forms as well. You can just put pictures on a form and then just say it connects to the next page or Google Slides. You can just have it click to certain spots. Uh, there are so many ways for a choose your own adventure, but the concept is so great. Yeah, and even analog. I mean, even if you just took a big piece of butcher paper and split your kids up into pairs or into small groups, and they just created by hand, pe paper, pencil, their, you know, tree of different directions, different choices. Even that can be just as powerful if you're a little jammed on time, you don't want to use the technology because technology's sometimes can be a little bit challenging. Sometimes that's just the easiest way to go. 
And now uh, the last of the top 10 I want to talk about here, I've just never heard of, but it looks so awesome. I'm curious. Fun employed. Fun employed. Yes. I have not heard. And, you know, I've played so many games. I've not heard of this thing. So please share fun employed with the, with, with everyone here. It's really not a very well-known game, and I'm kind of surprised because my kids have a lot of fun with it. I originally purchased it for my applied communications class because that's the class that we focus on business English and getting ready for the work world. And so to prepare for our interview unit, I just found this game on Amazon and said, hey, why not? We'll try it out. But it's really, really fun game and a really great way to practice interview skills and a little bit of argumentation skills too. So during the game, it's a, it's a card game, a bit like apples to apples. Every round, there is a job that you're applying for. Maybe it is supermodel or maybe it is private detective. Lots of different jobs. And then everyone starts with four cards and the four cards are all some kind of attribute that you have. And most of them are funny, you know, such as a British accent or nunchucks. And then more cards are also added to the middle of the table. And those cards are first come first serve. If you don't like one of the cards in your hand, you can swap it out for a card that's in the middle of the table. Whatever is going to make the best argument of why you with those attributes should get that job. Once everyone is happy with their cards, then everyone takes a turn explaining to the judge of why they would be the best at their job and why each, why and how each of those attributes would make them a good supermodel, nanny, private detective, race car driver, whatever it is. And then the judge chooses the best one. But it's a great way for my students, um, especially ones who really get a nervous in interview situations, to practice in a non-threatening type situation where it's just for fun and it's just joking around, but we really work on you need to explain your answer. Okay, if nunchucks are gonna help you be a private detective, explain why. What are you going to do with those? So it's a good first activity before we get into the actual practice inter interviews where it's a little bit more formal. But it could be just a great argumentation activity for any type of argument teaching. If you're teaching kids how to make a claim, how to use data, how to create a warrant for that, you could easily use Fun Employed just for that purpose too. Yeah, it actually sounds like it's just a very good, you know, I also, we're trying to, I try so hard to get students into role-playing games. Mm -hmm. uh, and that sounds like a great way to, as you said, get them the ability to feel comfortable acting a certain way, being silly, justifying what they do. Uh, yeah. That just sounds simple. I like it. I'm also going to have to go on Amazon and buy it myself now. Thank you, Melissa, for that. I have a new thing I got to buy. It, it's a great one. Do some of the, some of the cards are adult level. So I do encourage you go through the cards, make sure you choose the ones that are going to be appropriate for, for your students. Um, but it's another one where you could also even make up cards as well and just play it with cards that you make. If you want to take it to a more serious level, you can put on more realistic attributes such as punctuality and hardworking and use those as your cards going into the formal interview situation. Sounds easy. Now, at this point, I am. Uh, at this point, I just want to say thank you for coming on and sharing your top ten games. Uh, I'm mean, when I post this online, I will also share all your other twenty games if you're okay with it. That are Absolutely. also great for using online. Uh, you know, you seem to have all these games, and there's so many teachers here who probably would love to speak to you more about all these things what is the best way they could reach you to talk to you about all these different game ideas that you've used in classrooms? How can they find you? Oh, easiest way is definitely Twitter. Uh, my handle is at M-P-I-L-A-K-O-W, which is just 
first initial and the beginning of my last name because no one has time to say my whole last name, let's be honest. Um, you can also contact me even just via email at mpilikowski at vcsbadger.net if you want to contact me that way too. Either way, I'm happy to help, happy to give ideas, happy to help modify games that you're interested in. However, I can help teachers. I love games, love helping, love personalized learning and bringing fun to the classroom. And also, I would definitely recommend for all you teachers out there, even if you're not a teacher, you're a game designer, a gamer, check out the Games for Ed Twitter chat. Uh, definitely. Thursdays. That is a definitely. great time. Thursdays, 7 p.m. Central Time. Uh, and yeah, check that out as well for more ideas from Melissa in how you can really get games into your classroom super easily. And, you know, I will say, if you want to try something after hearing this episode, there are 10 games easily to do. We didn't talk about Pear Deck, um, and I know we didn't, but uh, Pear Deck is also a good flashcard game. Mm -hmm. uh, follow that. Uh, try one. Think of one you want to use and say, I want to use that my next day of school. Now, most likely this is going to come out during the summer. So when that episode comes out, think about, you know, my first week of school, what type of these games could I use? Clearly, a lot of these games, they are so good for the beginning of a lesson. So it's not that hard. Go with a mystery box at the beginning of a unit. Go with a... Uh, the other ones would be great for that. Uh, you know, go with a code names for them to see what they know. Go with a scattergories as a start or a Jenga writing to create. Just try something with your students because once you do, see if they are as responsive to games as uh, we have found in our experiences that they are. And some of them could be just great icebreaker games too for that first week of school. When you're looking to get your kids connected, there's nothing that connects kids together more, I think, than games when you put them in that game situation because it gives them a goal, but they're also indirectly getting to know each other through that medium as well. Yeah. Thank you so much for Melissa for being here. I greatly appreciate it. And Oh, you're welcome. It was fun. I look forward to hearing more uh, different games and education uh, as they come out. Me too. We'll stay in touch. Stop by Games for Ed chat anytime. Yes. And now I will stop the broadcasting, but now I'm just saying hello. Thank you, Melissa, for this as just the guest person saying it to you. Hold on. I put my face back on for this part. But I actually still, by the way, I keep it broadcasting just because you never know. I We find a sound bite or something I might want to keep in afterwards. But okay. uh, Thank you, Melissa. I, I do personally, you know me, I'm at your games chat whenever I can. I'm not putting my it, 5 p.m. is difficult for me, sadly, because I am either at martial arts or I am at putting my girls for lunch. It is oh, 5 yeah. to 6 p.m. is a difficult time for me because I'm on I'm in West Coast. Totally um, understand. But I do love your chat. It is a great place every time I am there. Good. Well, thank you so much. That means a lot. It does. And yeah, as I said, your episode will be up uh, when I can pull it up probably in about a month or two. I'm, I'm, I've am i actually wound up got a lot of interviews already there. So I like have my backlog, but I'm kind of like organizing them and when I want them and something like this, I definitely might plan to be like released in. I know my school starts like August 1st, but maybe like right there in the, the end of July, get teachers to brain start going as they're going back to classes. Awesome. That sounds great. Look forward and, to it. And I know this episode is pretty much like sadly a little bit of like you rehash of your presentation, but I appreciate that for the audience. Your presentation just seems so good. I hope you don't mind that you got, yeah, I just wanted you to get this audience to share this with because I think everybody should listen to these games. They were just so easy to use. Oh, good. Well, that that's the whole goal and just kind of kind of the gateway drug to get people onto more games as well. So that's my ultimate hope with all of this. Same here with the podcast. I hope more people play games. That is all I try to do all the time. And uh, we both keep working at it and we'll see what happens. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Well, I'm sad right. that you won't be at ISTE, but hopefully yeah. sometime in the future we'll meet face to face and uh, connect some more. It is hard for me to go. I would love to go to ISTE, but I'm try I have to, I think, budget myself to afford to pay my own way. And that would be yeah. tough. Um, yeah. Right now, I typically go to the Q conferences. I don't know if you know Q. Um, I've heard of it, yeah. They're more West Coast. Well, and, and those are like the Cali more kind of California-based. Yeah, they are. 
And so that's where I am. So I'm able to, you know, if I present at something, I'm able to get my district to help go there. Absolutely. And it's just hard for me to be like, yeah, because where is ISTE this year? It's in um it's Chicago this year. It's hard to be, yeah, it's hard to be for a district. I've got to, I kind of go to Chicago and, you know, and nah, I will later because I'm now going into making maker spaces. So mm -hmm. I really do want to do that. And ISTE would be a good place, but, you know, Definitely. we'll figure that one when, when that goes on. I'm going to be looking for maker conferences. I have permission to be flown around for that. Oh, that's awesome. Well, good luck with that. That'll be, I am not very familiar. I mean, I know the maker movement, but. That's something I'm not into. So well, you be know, interested to hear more about that. It's very funny. I'm actually so much more into the games like you do in the classroom. But since I am a Tosa and I'm outside the classroom, I uh, I, I I get I, I do the maker stuff, and then this is my side job of having fun getting to play games or try games with students as much as I can because they're just so much fun. They're fun. Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, and you then bet. I'll leave you to your day. Uh, have a good. Are you on summer break yet? Oh yes, yep. About a month now. Oh, me too. You guys got you guys got out like a uh, May thirty first. You're like us. Yeah. Well, we were at a, we were out May fifteenth. I think maybe May eighteenth, nineteenth was my last day. When do you guys start? Me. Um. Mid August. August fifteenth is usually our first day. How do you have your year? Seems interesting compared to mine. You have it must be different in California. The number of days of education. We have, I think we're required 170 or 175 student contact days. Mm -hmm. Essentially, we have like very few breaks. Got it. Just, uh, we take about two weeks off for Christmas, but, you know, spring break is only two days. Fall break is only two days. There's, oh, that explains it. You have a different, yeah, we have a week in one just, and week, yeah. Okay. It, it, it. it can be really tough, especially that third January, February, March. Ooh. I'm sure so, you must have a long, all there. You have a long break. That's also got to be nice. It it is. It is very right. rejuvenating. But well, I all right. Go. Well, thank you. I'll let you go. Have a great week. Okay. Bye. Bye.